All right. Hello, this is Stacy Krim interviewing Lenny Gerber for the Pride of the Community Grant Project. I'm here with David Gwynn, and the date is April 25th, 2019. Thank you for speaking with us today. My pleasure. Okay. Just can you give us a little background of where you grew up and what life was like? Well, I grew up in Brooklyn, North Carolina. Uh, Brooklyn, North Carolina? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, I said, oh my God, Brooklyn, New York. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I uh, was born in 1936, so that was before World War II. So I you know, experienced the, the ending of World War II and the joy of that street parties I remember from being young. Uh, I attended uh, James Madison High School which was the same high school that Ruth Bader Ginsburg went to. In fact, she was a senior when I was a freshman, as I learned uh, sometime from her. Before she was a judge, I met up with her and oh, wow. learned that. And Bernie Sanders and Chuck Schumer. So it's, it was quite a special high school, very good, a public high school. And um, I left, um, both of my parents were public school teachers. So uh, they were pretty strict about <laughs> learning, going to college and all that. But uh, I worked after I, I graduated high school in three and a half years uh, and then worked at the Girl Scout Council of Greater New York for a few months after that and then uh, went to college at Boston University, Sargent College, which was where you went if you were going to major in physical education. Mm -hmm. And I uh, graduated in 57 and started teaching then af thereafter at the University of Pittsburgh for three years. And then somehow, and I've never been able to remember how I got that way, I got it in my head that I belonged in Israel. And I, of course, Israel became a state in 48, and we're talking about now the... Uh, about 1960, and so they were, you know, trying to bring young people over, and, and I went over, and I actually lived there for a year, and 60, 61. And what was life like there at that time? Well, I I lived half a year in on a kibbutz, and worked, um, and half a year in Jerusalem. I did work for a while there too. I worked for the head of Hadassah Hospital. Uh, and by that time, I learned enough Hebrew to be kind of like a secretary. And life was, uh, it was interesting because it was so different and so um, important in some ways, you know, the, the establishment of the Jewish state. And, uh, and being in a foreign land is, you know, <laughs> it's, it's quite an experience. Mm -hmm. So I, I met many people and... I decided to leave. I went on, but I did go in the spring on an archaeological dig, and uh, we made a big find on that dig, and it there's a whole room in the uh, Israeli Museum in Jerusalem with the f findings for that. Um, and I that that was a wonderful experience to to do that. It was out in the the desert, and it just was that was a great experience. And when I left Israel, I uh, went to Greece, then Italy, then Germany, where Austria, where I had a friend. Uh, so I spent another six weeks or so traveling around on my own hitchhiking. Ran into my parents in, uh, at, at the, in the Vatican at a, at a Sunday service. I went to, to see what it was like and I'm standing there in the courtyard and the Pope is talking and I ran, ran into my parents <laughs> who I did not even know with, were in Europe. <laughs> oh, and I slept in youth hostels except for that couple of days in Italy when my parents were there and I got a good bed. Um, and I came back to the U.S. and took another job teaching at Ithaca College and after three years there I decided I needed to get my PhD if I was going to teach in universities and uh, 
So I took off and went to the University of Southern California. And I guess I'll stop at that point. I did earn my PhD there. But so why did you decide to focus on kinesiology? Well, it wasn't kinesiology. In those days, they called it phys ed, physical education. Uh, and actually, my focus was on the history and philosophy of sport. Uh, I never was a good athlete. I think I got into physical education because I had crushes on my camp counselors who all were phys ed majors, and I had crushes on my gym teachers and crushes. <laughs> <laughs> and I wound up in, in the wholly inappropriate for me field of <laughs> physical education. <laughs> but you're living the stereotype there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's how I got into it. And that's why I got in. So I then had to get into the academic side of the mm -hmm. field. And uh, there was a f fabulous woman uh, who had written books on the philosophy of sport. And she was at USC, so I went to study with her to get my PhD. And the first thing she said was, well, you have to have two areas, and I assume the other one will be history. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, as with your work in phys ed and kinesiology, you were quite the pioneer with um, advocating for women um, and equality. Can you speak to that? Especially your book, The American, Women in, American Women in Sport. Well, I, th I think it was really important for people to understand that women, you know, were not inferior to men, you know, whether you're talking about athletics or anything else. In fact, I, you know, I wrote a paper and I talked about, you know, that, you know, 80% of us are about the same. <laughs> Now, yes, men may be stronger at the at the far end, uh, but you know, basically, we are the same creatures. And so, I I did a lot of talking and speaking. What happened is, in 1970, I believe it was, we uh, we went to this conference in the summer. The the there was a national association of uh, physical education college women. People educators and they were they had a conference every two summers every other summer and we went to this conference and I woke up the first morning we were in Gold Lake Minnesota and Pearl and I had just done he had spent a month in Madison and she was working with someone and then we went on a 10-day canoe trip just the two of us and our cat had to, we were going to be gone all summer we had to take the cat with us so then we got, went to the canoe trip, and I was going to leave it in some vet's place. And they said, oh, no, 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 you can take it on the... <laughs> and we did. We took the cat on the 10-day canoe trip. The cat's name was Sappho. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and we took Sappho with us. Anyway, we went to this conference, and we woke up the first morning, and I said, you know, today is the 50th anniversary of women's suffrage. We got it, you know, these are all college women physical education professors, you know. And I think they're gonna love this. And I go around at the breakfast table and say, We gotta do something about this. And I wrote up a motion, you know, whereas, whereas, whereas now therefore we vow to the fight to fight for the rights of women. You know. It wasn't a very unusual thing, right? Well, first of all, we had a business meeting that morning. No, we, you can't bring up a motion at the business meeting. What? Okay, but we'll let you, after supper tonight, we'll have a special meeting before the evening program. You can bring it up there. So I take it to that meeting. And then for three hours, they never had the evening program. They're arguing about doing this. And I, it was insane. The menopausal wisdom was with me. But the young ones, they, you know, they had already succeeded. They were college, you know, in a university teaching. We're not, we're not discriminating. You know, we have a, they just didn't understand the reality of it. Mm -hmm. And so what happened is, that was 1970. They finally did pass it after all that. But what happened is Title IX was passed, I believe, in 1972, which calls for the equality of women and uh, education and sports and whatever. 
Um, and that made everybody have to think about it and, and do things and have they, they you just could not say the girls teams are different and therefore they don't get enough money or the same amount of money and as they were doing this they thought well who can help us who knows something about this and so I got invited to speak all over the place I went to, uh, and one, one place was uh, oh somewhere in New York what's two I can't think of the names of the two colleges a men's college and a woman's side by side Anyway, this was the woman's college, and I was brought into the president's office. And at some point, I said to him, uh, "Would you uh, maybe like to have lunch and or a cup of coffee in town with me?" I, I'd like. To, and he looked; he was very puzzled. I said, "I, I would like to see if uh, they charged you a different price for your meal than they would." charge me for the same meal and he, he you know he was just staring at me he could not understand i said well you know the girls get 250 a day for their meals when they go on an athletic trip and the boys get 450 or whatever the numbers were I, something like that and i th i thought maybe this town was different and they just charge different prices for meals that's why you do that <laughs> so that's the kind of that's the way i was in those days <laughs> Did you see a lot of um, discrimination in your time with working in physical education? Of course there was discrimination. Um, and, and even though, I mean, again, the salaries were different for the faculty. Most of us didn't know that, but it was becoming apparent and it certainly became apparent to me. And the amount of money the, the students got for the for per diem for eating and traveling, you know, when the teams traveled and all that was, was different, just as I'm talking about, I realized that was true. Um, it was, the even the facilities were, weren't, weren't equal, you know, everything, and it was particularly clear because we had a women's department and a men's department in those days, and soon after that they coalesced and they wouldn't let stop doing that, but you could, it was so obvious. Mm -hmm. And did you get any pushback from uh, male faculty in support as you were advocating for women's athletics? I I oh, I got s support all the way, and That's right. and, and interestingly at UMass, um, one day, you know that that in that time period, so I taught at UMass from 1968 to 1973, at the end of 73, I think, and. There was all, there were a lot of things going on at that time, and that's one of the times when the students were rioting or trying to, and so that was happening at UMass. And the president put together a committee, and he included me on it. There were four or five of us, and he included me on this to negotiate with the students and uh, to you know to get them to see what we were doing. And it was very smart of him. He had. He was a black man, and he had, uh, you know, we met. Uh, he just, he, you know, he made. It was hard for the students to argue <laughs> with people like me and him and and whatever. So, uh, so that was that was one of the things we, that I worked on there. It was, it was a good thing to do. Um, Did you meet Pearl as a student or as a faculty member? Uh, I met Pearl originally on my way to get my PhD and I had a, f I, in a summer camp a couple of years earlier I had a strong relationship with this woman and she kept saying to me oh and she was one of Pearl's students I wish you could meet my advisor you remind me of my advisor you would like my advice she kept talking that way you know it was it was nothing she wasn't trying to set us up. As a matter of fact, her partner and Pearl's partner worked together at the UAW, so it wasn't anything that she was trying to set up, she just did. So when I was going to California to do my PhD, she was going to ride with me, and I also had this woman, old friend from Queens, New York, who was teaching in the public schools in New York City. So 
Myrna and I got to Detroit and we stayed with Sue, the one who introduced me to Pearl, and she had her advisor for Sunday brunch. And there was a, a lot of talk about the American Federation of Teachers because a guy was running for president of the National AFFT and he was from New York and Pearl wanted to know what Myrna thought of him and all that kind of stuff so that was part of the scene. So I met Pearl then and there was no contact with her for a year. I mean, except for she sent me a note at the, right when I got to California introducing me to an Israeli former student who was also doing her doctorate with my advisor. And that was it. You know, that was the only contact. And the year went by. And then, so I was working on my PhD. It was the next summer, and I opened up the paper, and it said, the AFFT convention opens today in Los Angeles. And I thought, I wonder if that Pearl Berlin is going to come to that because she was going to this other one. And the phone rang. You'll never guess who this is. Pearl Berlin, I said. <laughs> so she said, um, well, A. Philip Randolph, in that he was the president of the sleeping car port as a black man, uh, is speaking tonight, and I thought maybe you'd like to hear him. So I said, I would, and I came down, and we heard him. Yeah, <laughs> it was good, and um, then it was in a hotel, you know, and we had a couple of drinks afterward, and she told me that, uh, I don't know what day of the week, but one day that week she had an appointment that um, one morning with my advisor, who, as I said, was a famous person, so that was not unusual. And I said, oh, well, let me come and get you and take you there, you know, from downtown L.A., no car onto the campus of USC. So she said, well, only if you let me buy you breakfast. So we had breakfast, then I took it to my advisor, and then we, uh, we, we, uh, I waited around uh, thinking they'll go to lunch and maybe they'll let me go, and, but she refused my advisor's invitation because she was meeting some f f colleague on the street, a male colleague on the street corner someplace. So I took it to pick him up and we I took them to all of us to the uh, what was then the brand new LA Museum of Art, which had just opened and it had a lovely outdoor uh, cafeteria that was covered but you know, but outdoors. Um, and we all had lunch there. And then I took Pearl to and he left and I took Pearl to see the, the Israeli student who had married and had a new little baby, and then I took her back to the hotel. So I had spent that day with her, and was duly impressed. I did not fall in love with her on that day, but I was duly impressed. And I, the next day, my advisor invited me to lunch, and it was the only time she ever did. And we went out to lunch. She took me to the faculty lunch place, and I said, "You know that Pearl Berlin is so smart. She." You know, you know, I'm going to be looking for a job this year, and I would love to work with someone like her. I don't care where I work. I need to work with somebody that's smart and I, that I can respect and look up to. And she said, well, I'll be going to Michigan in the fall. Pearl was teaching at Wayne State University at the time. And uh, I'll see what I can do. And so she did, and then I got a note from Pearl saying, we have a job opening for next year, are you interested?" And I said, yes, and I flew to Detroit in between semesters, and so I stayed four days, stayed with my friend, and I saw Pearl each of those days. Um, she had made dinner for me one night, and on Sunday she invited this faculty member and her partner over for um, brunch. Yeah, it was. Anyway, by the end of that time, I was head over heels. And my friend could see it, hear it, <laughs> and I wasn't saying it, but she could see it. And she said, you know, she has a partner, you can't do this, don't worry about it, I would never say a word. And she even, I learned later, she even took Pearl out to lunch and uh, not for a walk and, and warned her about me. The problem was, Pearl felt the same way. <laughs> and she did not hesitate 
to let her feelings be known. And so then, in some, sometime at the end of March, she had a, she called and she had a she was going to a convention in Chicago and she had a room and why don't I come? So I had no money, you know, for TA. I, I had to get some money from my parents. Why do you have to go? You already have a job. Oh, of course I have to go. It's a professional conference. So I went and we consummated the relationship. <laughs> and had a wonderful, um, you know, it was three, just three or four days, but that was it. I mean, no question. Uh, and then... And then uh, the end of May, the Memorial Day weekend, I was going to leave L.A. to go to Michigan to drive, and Pearl said, well, I'll fly to Oklahoma and drive the rest of the way with you, and so she did. And the, on June 2nd, 1966, that was, this, that was when, when we got to, um, we were in western Michigan, staying at the Lord Jeffrey something in and we had dinner and then after dinner we had a conversation about what's going to happen and in that conversation we agreed that we would live together from the start that is we'd find a place Not that day but we talked about should we have two apartments and get to know each other no said I <laughs> you're too you're too a busy woman you're always at, you know and I said, fine you can be out all night doing professional stuff as long as you come back, that's fine. But I don't want to be someplace where I'll see you twice a week because <laughs> that's all you have at the time. So she, she agreed and we said we'd have an apartment and within a month we were ensconced. And that was it for the, <laughs> from then till she died last year. Right. So um, what was the climate like for you as a couple in the 1960s? We were more open than most people. Nobody talked about it, though. But we were open in this sense. In that time period, you were supposed to pretend that this is her bedroom and this is my bedroom. We never did that. We had one bedroom. She came to the apartment with her bedroom set. It's a double bed. The, the bed was a double bed. It's in the guest room now. <laughs> And we, and when people came, you know, they, they, you get a tour of the apartment, some of them, and, yeah, and so everybody could see we slept together, and we didn't pretend otherwise, but nobody talked about it. But on the other hand, nobody rejected us, nobody said nasty things to us, but you know, we were in a universe, our lives were in universities, I mean, our friends were professionals for the most part um, and so those were people that wouldn't dream of that kind of negativity you know they, they would make them seem like they were dumb and the other thing is of the college women's physical educators my guess would be that about 80% of them were lesbians so the professional groups we were associated with that was just very common it also was very common not to talk about it, but, and so we didn't. But we just, it was not a difficult life because of the circumstances of, of our lives. Mm -hmm. And at what point did you move to North Carolina? So in uh, 1971, well, 1971, Pearl, was recruited to come down here. They were going to start a PhD program in the what is now the kinesiology department, um, and they wanted her to run it. And she was. We had gone to the from Detroit to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and it did not work out well for Pearl. The head of the women's department was very jealous of her, and it just was not working out. It was better for me, everything was working for me, but she, not for her. So I agreed, and I was, I, my assumption was that they would hire me as well. Uh, just as they had at UMass, they had recruited her for UMass, and they hired me. 
So I wasn't worried about it. But um, my friends down here said, well, you let Pearl establish her position and give her a year to get... If you want to be hired, that's what you need to do. Let her have her year. So we came down here. We bought the house in Jamestown, a house in Jamestown. And I was I would come down every three weeks. I'd fly down. Of course, we had all those holidays, Christmas and Thanksgiving, and you know, spring breaks, fall breaks, everything. So it wasn't, you know, I, 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 I saw her regularly, and I lived for one year in the house with someone on the faculty, and then another half a year with someone else, because um, I was involved in something that I just wasn't ready to leave. And then I came down after a year and a half, I left UMass. Again, still thinking that I, they would hire me. And they said, no, we will not hire you because you two are too open. These are these lesbians. You're too open. So, <laughs> so in the meantime... Were you told that straight out from, from UNCG administrators? Not the administrators, but faculty members, yes, I okay. was told that straight out. I, maybe I should have pursued it and demanded to sit down with the head, and, but it didn't seem, I mean, it seemed pretty clear she was the one who was saying it. I mean, the faculty wasn't, she was. So, in the meantime, uh, I was right, that was, I was just finishing the book on the American woman in sport. I had two other books written already, published already. Uh, one on philosophy and one on history. Um, and I was doing that and um, running around speaking, you know, giving this. And then and I was invited to teach summer school. Um, so I taught in Strasburg, I taught in uh, three times in Texas, twice at Austin and one at uh, Houston, Houston. And uh, the second time Pearl came and she took two taught in Austin and then we went out and taught in Minnesota. So I was doing summer school and going to law school. So I, I decided when they said they wouldn't hire me, so one of the faculty gave me a list of all the colleges around here and said you can you could get a job at one, probably any one of these. But I not none of them had a graduate program. None of them had the kind of work I was by then doing, you know, teaching graduate students and history and philosophy. None of them had those programs. And I just, and I, the closest would have been Carolina, and I didn't want to do that commute. And so, I don't know, I, to this day, I cannot tell you how it popped into my head, but I decided I'm going to go to law school. So I applied, I went and looked at Carolina and I looked at Duke and I wouldn't even consider Wake Forest because it was at that time a very conservative sort of right-wing evangelical style university. Uh, it changed a lot since then. But So I went to Carolina and I sat down with the associate dean and he said, well, you have your Great, your undergraduate grade point average multiplied by this particular number, whatever it was, plus the score on your LSAT, the law school admission test, and then we make a list. And you go down the list, you know, from whatever the numbers are, the highest numbers get invited. So, okay, go to Duke, and they want to, they had a, they, they didn't, weren't that specific, but oh, I had to have a, um, a recommendation from my undergraduate dean. I said, I don't even know if my undergraduate dean is alive at this point. What about the deans I, I just currently work for? And, and I had been very popular with the administration from the time of, of my working with the president. And, and they said, no, it has to be your undergraduate dean. So I wrote a letter to his secretary who was still there all those years later, to see if, if he, where he was, and she said, well, he wrote a letter of recommendation about you and put it in your file, and she actually produced it and sent it to them. Um, I had never known that until that was done. Um, and so I did not get into Duke. <laughs> <laughs> And I wasn't getting into Carolina either, and I mean, you know, time was going on, and I had Pearl call, 
And the woman, because you could do a free phone call from UNCG in those days, long distance calls, you know. Uh, and, and she called uh, to ask if what was happening, and the woman said, well, I wouldn't get my, your hopes up, dear. So I sat there and I thought, what the heck, what am I going to do? So I took out my resume, which was a fine resume, and, and I wrote and I said, I just want you to know I'm not a failed something, this associate dean, I'm not a failed something or other, I want you to see my resume. I know that you have some discretion, because in those days they had to get more women in the law school, more blacks, you know, and so I knew they had, that he, it couldn't be all that. Two days later I got admitted. <laughs> And years later, when I retired from my full-time work, I got on the ACLU of North Carolina board, and at the same time, his wife, that associate dean's wife, got on the board. <laughs> I told her this story, and it amused her a lot. Um, so you go from, just to step back a minute, living in northern states and California as a couple, and then you moved to the south. Correct. How was that different? Uh, well, to start with, the fact that we were who we were, and that was going to prevent me from getting a job, that was very different. I mean, that alone was hugely different. Uh, I was scared living in the South. Uh, not only, I'm, I'm, I'm lesbian and I'm a Jew. And prejudice against Jews and Catholics was something I knew about in the South. I, I had... Uh, seen it. I'd seen signs on beaches, white Protestants only, you know. So I knew. And in fact, we lived in a house in Jamestown and there were woods behind it and on the other side of the woods was a farm. And the farmer's wife came over soon after we moved in to welcome us and invite us to church on Sunday. And I stood there thinking, shall I tell her I'm a Jew? You know, that, that's, that was how nervous I was in, in a sense. I did, of course. But um, otherwise, in in the, that sense of you know ordinary everyday life, it wasn't so different because again, we were always connected to university people and friends of were faculty and and even though I was a student, I was in law school. It's not quite the same thing as being a a student uh, mm -hmm. in, as an undergraduate, for example. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, but interestingly, just w one little, in again, going back to that associate dean. So I'm after, so sometime in the second semester I'm in law school, there's a faculty member, I want, remember who I realize is a lesbian, and I wanted to work with her, you know, like, like being a TA, but, you know, you get a little money. And, and so... Um, and she wanted me to, and I had to get permission from the associate dean, the same one. So I go down to his office, the secretary, I say, is the dean in there, Dean Gelvin there? And she said, yes, go on in. So he's, I'm not announced, I'm not, he has no idea I'm coming. I walk in, ah, Miss Gerber, he says, do you still live with that woman? Because I had to, I had to uh, fill out a, f a whole long form to establish my residency here so I could get to residential tuition, you know, rather than, um, sorry, you want to come in? Come on, it's all right, you can come in, they won't hurt you. It's okay, it's really okay. Come on, yes, come on, it's okay. Nobody will hurt you, I promise. I really promise. Come on. Come on. David is allergic to cats, so oh, I don't know oh, if, oh. if he doesn't want in. Yeah. Oh, we don't want to. <laughs> All right. So, um, anyway, uh, so I had to fill, in order to get my resident tuition, so I, I could prove I was down here. In fact, I thank God I voted down here even though I was still up there <laughs> because my vote in Massachusetts wouldn't have made a difference. You know, but it, it, because it's such a liberal state, but it was the uh, 1970. Uh, uh, anyway, so I so coming down here, 
I voted and I had a bank account and I, had a, I owned a home and I had to explain all that and I had to give the details. Um, and so he, in his head he still remembered all that and says, are you still living with that woman? Or, I thought, wow, scared the heck out of me, really. Because I really was worried and, I, and that was the one thing that, that worried me. At that time, when I graduated, which was 77 from law school, there were cases. You, you, one of the things, in addition to the bar exam that you had to take, you had to have an interview with professional attorneys who were doing these interviews before you could get your license, your law license. You had to have, have that interview and be sort of... I don't know what they were doing with it, but you had to do it. And, and in fact, it seemed to me like there were three people at the interview, but maybe not. But you did have to do that. And there were cases in which people were rejected. In Florida, for example, there was a guy rejected for Bobby because he was gay. So I began to be a bit worried about that kind of thing here. Mm -hmm. And not trying not to be as open as I was because I was worried that... It could keep me from getting admitted to the bar. Mm -hmm. That was still a problem. And just to also step back a little bit again, how did your family react to your relationship with Pearl? My mother, we had been together about just under 10 years. When my parents visited us, we were in Jamestown, and we had an open conversation. Now, everyone knew, you know, in my family, they knew, but this outright open conversation. And my mother said, I will never condone this. We will never condone this. Those were her words. So she, that was not very a good, just a good conversation in that regard. So this was in, oh, I'd say the winter of 76. Um, there, my parents' 50th anniversary was May 27th uh, or 9th, <laughs> May 27th, and we were giving a party for them, my sister and I, the, and Pearl's and my anniversary was June 2nd. So, and some friends were, who lived in Pennsylvania were giving us a party. Anyway, my first thing, my, my sister told me my mother was furious when the invitations went out and had my sister, her boyfriend, me, and Pearl's names all on it. My mother says to my sister, what is Pearl's name doing on this? And my sister, who never had a penny to her name, said, well, who do you think is paying for this party? I mean, <laughs> Pearl had to pay for it. So we go to Brooklyn and we have this 50th anniversary party and I'm walking around and my parents' best friends were who we called Uncle and Aunt, Uncle Sam and Aunt Miriam. And Uncle Sam is sitting in the living room at some point and I go over to talk to him. What I didn't know that is my mother's behind me. And Uncle Sam says, so where are you going from here? And my mother says, they're going to Pennsylvania. Some friends are giving them a 10th anniversary party. Just in sort of that tone of voice. And Uncle Sam jumps to his feet, takes my hand in both of his, and he says, Mazel tov, Mazel tov. I'm so happy for you. And that did it for my mother. That changed it. She tried it out. Her, her friend saw nothing wrong with it. And she gave it. <laughs> 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 and I never heard another word about it. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> is that a great story? It's true. That's a great story. <laughs> great story. <laughs> That's so typical. <laughs> um, so, once you moved to the Triad area, um, where did you and Pearl go to socialize and, and be around other members of the LGBT community? Well, Pearl and I always entertained. You know, Pearl had 
was always entertaining before I, she knew me, you know. She she was just that kind of person. And I, even though I was an introvert, I was happy to entertain people. And that's good, because then you have things to do. <laughs> you don't have to sit around and talk to people. Usually, when I went to a party, I would get find a book and go sit down in the corner and everybody would talk. So, so we just had friends, you know, at our home and got my friends' homes and you went... You know, I don't think there was any. Um, he, he did the same thing that anybody else would do. Mm -hmm. Did the LGBT community in the area seem like a unusually large amount for you for this area, or was it less than you were expecting? I wasn't expecting anything. In those days, we were not. You ha we, it was something A, you didn't talk about, and B, you didn't sort of look for the community. You know, you, you had made your friends, and most of our friends were gay and lesbian because we, again, we were with university faculty, somehow it, it wasn't hard. Um, but also because even whoever you were associated with, you know, you just, just did it. You, it wasn't something that you th being a couple is a lot easier than being single and one of the things even uh, it always annoyed me with my parents if one of their friends husbands died for example then the woman would not be invited out to dinner with the group you know what and I'd say Teddy why 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 don't you have um, this person well, it's a awkward about who's going to pay and you know, and an odd number and I it was just they you know the men would all pay and if the, the husband had died well then then the woman wasn't invited. it was just I hated that kind of thing but I mean that's the way the world was and but we were all you know we had a lot of friends that were couples and single and we just it was a our social life was always um, comfortable. And I don't, I don't, uh, I don't remember any time in which I ever felt uh, short on, on friendships and things to do. Okay. Um, so but, you you go to Chapel Hill. You get your law degree. Correct. Um, what area of law did you focus on? Uh, I didn't focus on any area of law at the time. I. Uh, they, you didn't really get that kind of an education where it was aimed at. You could say, "Okay, I want to be a consumer lawyer." That I I don't know even if they do that today. I think the law school was just general. Uh, you get a clerkship someplace, and maybe. And but I didn't. I see my first two summers of law school instead of trying to get a clerkship. I was invited to teach at places, and I could make more money and do that, so I continued to do that. So I, I never did have any kind of clerkship or anything like that. So then I started the, the uh, then I'm in my third year of law school, and I, I have no idea what's, where I'm going to work, you know, and people came and did interviews, and, uh, you know, you we went to the law, to some room in the building, and they did interviews. And so, it was Christmas of that year, and a class night from law school, a gay guy, called me, and he said, "You might be interested in this. There's a notice on that's just been put on the board, and I, of course, I wasn't going back there until the next semester. Uh, there's a job opening in Winston Salem at the Legal Services Office, and so." That, of course, interested me. And all the other interviews I had, not only did I not get, they didn't want me, I didn't want them. You know, it just, I, no, I did, none of them appealed to me. Nothing got to me until I went to the, the, the legal services people came. And I was the first one they interviewed that day. And... They, the, there were two men, and one of them said, uh, why do you want a job like this? And I remember my response. I said, 
because I've been fighting the bastards all my life. And this is an opportunity for me to continue doing that. <laughs> and I got invited for another interview, this time in the office. And uh, and I went and everything worked out. <laughs> I got the job. And... Uh, Later, I became the managing attorney, and a couple of years later, they started having managing attorneys in legal aid, and I was the first one. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, it was perfect job for me because I used to teach. It was teaching, uh, and I had already had good trial experience. I, you know, new lawyers are scared to death, and I was always scared to death. I'd lose six to eight pounds. You lost a few. Pounds. I have. I have to <laughs> just get in. I'm only, I'm only ashamed we don't, we can't turn the camera around to try to get the kitty on the camera. Yes. Oh, yes. Hi, Brexy. Well, hello. What's Hi, your Brex name? Brexy. I'm allergic, but I love Brexy. Yeah. This is Brexy. Brexy. Psst, psst. Hello. How are you? Yeah. It's good to meet. Oh, yeah. Now my day is complete. I hope that part is coming across on the camera. We'll, we'll probably edit this one. <laughs> out, but, oh, I know. But now, I, now I need to get her release. <laughs> so we're inter interviewing her as well. <laughs> well, hello. How old is she? About three. Oh, wow. I love the orange. Yeah. That's really vibrant. Yeah, she had clearly yeah. had a, an orange cat in her, her grandpa probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, I had a second cat who died last week. Oh, so. I'm so sorry. Yeah. That's awful. Oh, she said, thank you for letting me in. I'm yeah, she's... You know, I have, to, I have to put my mark on everything. I'm glad we, we have met her approval. She was a bit worried about us at first. Purring away and everything. <laughs> He's allergic to you, pussycat. Don't bother him. Get that purr on, can on recorder. Okay, I guess we'll just continue. Yeah. <laughs> Where were we? Yeah. Oh, okay, I got my job, right. So. Winston Salem. Yeah, 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 yeah yes, the I was starting the bastards. And, uh, and so I, so I, that job is the one job I've wanted from the interview. It's a, and I got the job, and that couldn't have been a better... I mean, I didn't like commuting to Winston necessarily, but short of that, it couldn't have been a better job than... What sort of, uh, what did you do with Winston Salem? But just, just oh, okay. interestingly, talk, we talked about the inequality mm -hmm. from women. So the salary they offered me, gave me, was something like, um, oh, $12,000 a year or something like that. And I, and he said, I'm sorry because you, I know you're experienced and all that as a teacher, and but... That you're a brand new lawyer, and that's what our salary is. So fast forward now, that was, you know, earlier, sometime early in this during the winter time. I graduate from law school, and the next thing you know, you have to do is take the bar exam, and they had a course at Wake Forest for taking the bar exam, and um, my. The person who was going to be my director tells me, you know, while I'm there, he tells me, look for, I've hired a second person, his name is Ben Erowitz, and he'll be the only one in the audience, in the group with the beard, because Wake Forest students, of course, never would have had a beard in the 70s. And so look for a guy with a beard, and, and so I immediately find Ben. And in the course of, and we become friends immediately, I come home and I say to Pearl, I think he's gay. She says, you think everyone is gay. He goes to his partner and says, you th I think she's gay. And he said the same thing that Pearl said. So I invite Ben to come. We had a lake house at the time at Baden Lake. I invite him to come and study with me on the next Saturday. 
and 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 I said to Pearl, if he's gay, he's going to want to bring his boyfriend. He said, oh, can I bring my roommate with me? <laughs> <laughs> and Ben and Eugene you know, have remained our friends to this day. They attended our wedding. Uh, <laughs> but in the course of getting friendly with Ben, I discovered that he was going to pay 14000 I mean, we're both just out of law school. There's no arguable excuse. Thorns has already explained to me that despite all my good work experience, he could only give me the same the salary of a brand new lawyer. And he has been just getting out of law school and he's got 2000 more. I picked up the phone. I hadn't started working yet and called him. And he said, th called the director, Thorns. And I said, he... I, I understand that Ben is getting paid. And he said, oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I meant to, to tell you, I'm going to up your salary to that. That's the blah, blah, blah. So I got the same salary. But honestly, and if I hadn't called, I wouldn't have pushed it. And that's, and that's a liberal, you know, you can't get a more liberal organization. And everybody who works there has to be liberal <laughs> to do the kind of work you're doing for legal aid. Um, so what type of work did you do with legal aid? Well, I did become a consumer law specialist. I did a lot of bank, and, and as part of that, I did a lot of bankruptcy work because someone named Elizabeth Warren had just rewritten the bankruptcy law nationally, and that made it very possible to save people, my poor clients' cars and homes and uh, whatever, because... I could do that, and I so I used that as a great talent. And I, uh, I would read, and when I needed to understand this or that or the next thing, I would read the writings of Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's one reason that I am supporting her for her for presidency because she's one of the few people running who's accomplished real things in life, and she and the Consumer Finance Act, for example, that's. That's what she wrote. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of consumer law, and I did, a, but I did, you know, landlord tenant law, tons of it, and all that kind of stuff. Um, with at legal aid, and then, as I said, we, they, um, they decided to have a managing attorney, and I applied for and got that position, and I think I did very, very well in that. Uh, what were some of your most memorable cases working with the legal aid? <laughs> it was terrible. I can't. I'm trying to remember. I just. I did do a lot of. Um, I have to. I. I cannot answer that question at this point. Okay. I did a, a, a number of cases in the state Supreme Court and uh, in the Court of Appeals, uh, and one of the, I know one of them established uh, the debt collection. Uh, I mean, there were a couple of my cases that actually established principles that are still in effect in consumer law. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I retired. One of the things that happened is, when you finish law school, you have a, they have a four-day, three-day session in Raleigh, you know, where you get lectures all day long, sort of getting you acquainted with North Carolina law. And for several years, they invited me to come and do the consumer law lectures. Um, and I did get the first, the Bar Association decided to make rewards for various areas of the law and uh, I did get the first award for consumer law. Got lots of phone calls from other lawyers, you know, asking me how to do those cases. Um, but I can't remember that the, the memorable ones. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Including those that, that the Supreme Court had a rule on. And, uh -oh. Hmm. 
Well, uh, if you come up with any. <laughs> yes. Did any of your cases while you were working with the Winston-Salem Legal Aid involve LGBT issues? No. Okay. No, they did not. When did you start working more um, with LGBT issues in law? Well, when I, f I retired um, in 91, which was early, I was 56, and just about that time, along with me and Sharon, th there had been um, a North Carolina Association of Women Attorneys, which had started in the late 70s. And I was very involved. I was on the committee that spent a whole year getting ready to have this organization, writing bylaws. And, you know, they would come out to our lake house, and the, and the people on the committee, and we would have a, um, a day between swim and work. So I was on that group. And we established the, the Association of Women Attorneys, and it, it is in effect still and a very fine organization uh, that has an annual meeting and you can get up to, I think, six or seven CLE credits. You know, you have to have continuing, 12 continuing ed legal education credits a year. So you, you got to go to, you, it's good to go to a conference where you can get six or seven in a weekend. Mm -hmm. um, I mention that because one of, so having been involved with all that, when I retired. So I was the second president. I, actually, the first one called president. The first one was called the coordinator, and I always tease her that I was the first president, <laughs> but she was, really. Um, so we, um, so I had experience doing that kind of thing, and one of the other women who was also involved in creating that organization, Sharon Thompson in uh, Durham, and I, and a bankruptcy lawyer from Greensboro, male, uh, we got together and decided to start the uh, uh, North Carolina Association of Gay and Lesbian Attorneys, NC Gala. And so we started that in the 90s. And uh, that, I, I'm not sure that it has still exists in the sense of having annual meetings, but that from the years I was still practicing, Fully, uh, I mean, we we that organization was uh, was it was not only did it give us a chance to have a group of NC of gay and lesbian attorneys, which we did and had annual and we had annual meetings and all that kind of thing, but we really got to train lawyers in what you do with gay and lesbian clients. You know, it's not the same. You have to really treat it differently than in those days, a married couple. Because uh, married couples, things were ordin ordinarily, you know, they inherited each other's things. If you were a married couple, you automatically got a deed that said tenancy by the entirety. And that meant that the survivor would get it if someone died. But if you were a straight couple, that would not happen automatically. And if you were a gay couple, a, a gay couple, straight couple, yes, okay. either one, you did not have any automatic anything. Okay. So most lawyers, when if you did a deed, they would just have you the two names on, and that was a tenancy in common. Well, they wrote the words tenancy in common. But there is a, was another kind of tenancy, and it was joint tenancy with right of survivorship. And that was a phrase that I learned in law school, and that meant then that this, the, the joint tenant got, got the inherited. So, of course, that was one of the things I, I would preach about. And I would, every, when I had clients sitting in here in this room, I would and was writing things, I would tell them, you know, if you're getting a house, have this on the deed. I, or I would be writing up documents that use that phrase, like bank accounts or financial things. I had I had prepared something, a, a deed, and a lawyer had written on it. The person who was selling, you know, the who was taking care of the buying of a property, saying, I've advised these people not to do this, not to write it that way. 
I mean, there was a there was a statute book that said if you just looked at the headline, no joint tenancy with right of no joint, and then when you read the case that they were talking about, it's not what it said. It was just, the book was wrong in its headline of that section, but lawyers never would look past it. When when Pearl and I finally uh, we were going to get a a financial account, um, you know, an investment account. We had didn't have one, and, and a lot of friends had one. And there was a woman who took care of them in uh, Greensboro, and and I wanted it with a joint tenancy with a survivorship. And she said, "You can't do that." I said, "I can. I'm a lawyer. I'm that." I wrote. She said, well, I'm sorry, but the people in New York, this would, uh, this may have been, I forget, Merrill Lynch. It was a Merrill Lynch person. And she, and I, and she said, they won't do it because you can't. I, so I wrote and sent three cases showing that you can do it to Merrill Lynch in Manhattan, in New York. And they said, no, fine. So I, we opened up one in Winston at a different agency, a different company. And then about a year after that, we, I got a letter saying from this woman, and she said, they've changed their mind now, and you, you can't. I said, forget it. <laughs> but that, that is how stupid, I mean, it was, that, that was one of the great difficulties. They did not know how to handle lesbian and gay clients. And, they, and so uh, I gave lectures. Elon College, for example, when they opened up their School of Law downtown, I, they invited me to their classes and, and you know, wills and, that, to, and to speak about what they had to do, you know, to give them that kind of advice and tell them how to, how, how to treat their clients and what to say to them. And, you know, I mean, I always would begin by saying, if two men or two women come and sit in front of you, assume they are gay and go from there, you know. <laughs> Ask them, you know, be, and explain to them why you need to know. Because if if that they are, they need, you know, you want to have certain things, and that was one of the most important um, phrases and most important things that I did. Uh, and I, you know, I'll give lectures on the subject. How do you handle these? The what you have to put in wills, for example. For, for another thing, I always put in wills. So these lesbian or gay couples, male couples, had family, and the family was not going to be not going to be happy. Have, they're leaving something to their lovers, you know. Again, none no, none of us was married or ever dreamed we were going to get married in, the, in our lifetime. So I always would put in a will. I have not left this property or this thing or that thing or this house to my parents or siblings, or siblings, not out of any lack of love or affection, but because I believe they are otherwise provided for. And I, I would actually put something like that in a will because you just didn't want to take the chance that someone could fight it and say, no, you, that person can't have these things. And, and and that's and that was life. And that's in the '90s when I started doing all these wills for, for my uh, lesbian, gay clients. I went through that in the 2000s too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it was that. That's the way it, it it you had to, and the and the bar had to learn it, and and the um, society had to learn it, but. Um, I once had two nuns come in here, and it was it was a riot. You know, they were so scared. <laughs> but I I did it uh, so that I think I think that was a an important contribution to uh, doing to le le giving people legal rights that they needed to have, mm -hmm. and it made a difference. And I'm telling you, when my sweetheart died last May, it was next to nothing to get everything taken care of because everything we had was of course it was before we were married that we took ownership on things so uh, mm -hmm. 
and I didn't bother changing because I didn't need to because everything had right of survival on it every financial document when did uh, you get married at the synagogue? In uh, on our 47th anniversary, which was June 2nd, 2013. Yeah. Um, why did you decide at that time to, to get married? Mary. Well, what happened was two things were going on. One was that this, the Windsor case had just come down in the Supreme Court, and Edie Windsor had and they had a lot, she was the widow of her, uh, and, and there was a problem about whether or not she was going to get a in, in certain inheritance. And that case uh, came down in her favor. Uh, it wasn't, there wasn't a marriage, it wasn't an issue of whether gays could get married, but it was certainly an issue that supported the idea. Um, Kennedy opinion. And so that started me, you know, just thinking about it. I went to an NCCJ dinner, that's National Council for Community and Justice or whatever, yeah, uh, which is an, an old, very old organization. They always have had an annual meal. And I, we didn't usually go to those, but the, sometimes if someone I knew was getting a, an award, I would go. So Pearl and I went to that one, somebody was getting an award. and. I went to get a drink and I came across Rabbi Havivi, who had been the, from Beth David, the conservative rabbi who had been opposed to gay marriage and he had declined to allow two lesbian rabbis to have an ufruf celebration, not a marriage, but just the ufruf in the synagogue because he was opposed to it. Uh, and I came upon this rabbi and I said, you know, what with the way the Supreme Court's going these days, it's time to think about getting married. And he said to me, I'll do it. I'll do it in your home or the shul or wherever you want. And I just couldn't believe it. And I went back to the table and told Pearl and then my niece came over and I told her and she said, well, you're going to do it, aren't you? I said, well, I don't know. Um, and she said, look at Pearl, <laughs> look at you, I mean, meaning you're getting old. <laughs> and, and so I went home and I thought, well, if we're going to get married, this is like in March or in February when they have these dinners, I, and I thought, if we were going to get married, when would we do it? Well, our anniversary is June 2nd. What day of the week is June 2nd? And I pulled out the calendar and it was a Sunday. Bichette fate. <laughs> and I said, okay, we'll get married on June 2nd. <laughs> and that's our 47th anniversary. And so that's what happened. And, and the rabbi did it. And we had about 135 people at the ceremony. And uh, we had two rabbis, actually. Sapira Donsky was the other one, a, a good friend of ours, who's also a rabbi. Um, and so we had this whole ceremony, and you can see on the wall the pictures of, uh, and they're out there, of our wedding. Mm -hmm. That's a one frame big thing. I'll show it to you. So that was when we decided, that's how we got decided to get married. And then, of course, soon after, the next year, the Obergefell case came down, which said you could get married anywhere. So what happened is, though, besides getting married in the synagogue with this big ceremony, well, two things are funny about it. The, the, two stories have, have to go with this. One is, we sit down, we're in the rabbi's office, as is typical before a wedding, and family is in there, and the, the ketubah has to be signed. And so we're sitting at the table with the rabbi and the ketubah, and he hands me a pen and to sign it. And I said, before I sign this, I want to know something. And he said, what? If I want a divorce, well, I have to get a get, which is a Jewish divorce. And he said, what? I said, if I want a divorce, well, I have to get a get. He said, yes. He was angry because, you know, what are you doing asking about a divorce? And I sighed and I said, oh, thank God. I said, I just wanted to be sure that I have a legal Jewish wedding. 
don't have a, you know, I'm not legally married in North Carolina, but I want to be sure I have a legal Jewish wedding. And if I have to get a get, that makes, tells me I have a legal Jewish wedding. So I signed the document. <laughs> How did um, Pearl react to that question? <laughs> she, I don't know. I, knew, I never looked at what she was doing. I was just looking at the rabbi who was just going nuts. So, Anyway, so we get married, so we have this legal Jewish marriage, but we're still not legal in any other way. However, by that time, there were federal benefits for legally married gays because they had already started marriage in states like what, New Hampshire, I think, and other, some other places, Maine. So we decide to go to Maine for our honeymoon, and we buy tickets and we're getting ready. and get a phone call. A rabbi who had a congregation in Portland for many, many years, Harry Skye, came out at gay at age 80, moved down here because his daughter lives in Greensboro, had actually come to our wedding, although I had not known that, um, because I didn't know him, but I had met him in a restaurant who was there with someone else. And Rabbi Sky calls me, um, this is in the summer, before we go on our honeymoon, and in the course of the conversation, he tells me he's, he's uh, going to Maine for, for, back to Maine for the summer or something like that. He calls, and I said to him, oh, we're going to Maine on our honeymoon, and I said, we're going to get married again in Maine because I figured, well, then I'd, we'd be eligible for federal benefits. So we would be legally married on a federal level. It's still not in North Carolina, but, but I thought that would be a good thing, being the lawyer I am. And, and Rabbi Sky says, well, I'll marry you. I, I, I still have access to my, you know, place. And Anyway, so what happened is, and we went to Maine. We had our honeymoon in in a place near Camden. We went to Camden on our last day there and got a marriage license. And we went to uh, Portland, and the ma rabbi married us in the little chapel in the Jewish center at Portland or whatever it was called. Um, and they had a little cha very nice chapel, and he pulled in a couple of witnesses, you know, people who worked there. And so we got married a second time, a few months after our first one. And then that gave us a legal federal marriage, which disappointed the clerk of court down here uh, because he wanted uh, uh, us to be the first ones <laughs> when, they, when it became legal that day. Uh, but that didn't happen because we couldn't get married again. Can you, um, because you and Pearl were very much the cover couple for the gay marriage fight in North Carolina, can you talk a bit about being the plaintiffs in those cases? Well, we, uh, when they were deciding, you know, to, to do the uh, lawsuit, the uh, ACLU of North Carolina did it, so of course I knew all those people and uh, they, had asked us to be, there were about four couples um, that they had asked. And all of us were older or some had some illnesses. And the idea was they were going to argue that they couldn't wait. They, it was time, they had to have a, the merit, you know, the ability to get married. And so uh, they asked us if. I, I don't remember, I think I made some recommendations, but they had some people too who had asked them to do something. So I, they, they had decided that they would file that case and uh, I had, I worked with them, you know, I was on the board for eight years and, and also I worked, I would help, I stayed on the legal committee until 19, uh, until I was 77 years old <laughs> when I decided I had enough committees. So I, you know, I, I was always involved with the ACLU, so it was logical. <laughs> I did not know until it happened that they were going to decide to make us the named plaintiffs. 
but I, that was I had no part in that decision, and they did. Um, and so then they had a press conference, and and you know we were there, and all the couples were there, and they had this press conference, and that was kind of fun, and. And then nothing happened in terms of the case. You know, the file, the papers all got filed and briefs were written, I guess, but the court just never ruled in the middle district. Um, of course, the case was Gerber and Berlin et al. versus Attorney General Roy Cooper. So the night that the Fourth Circuit, uh, the Supreme Court, at some point, the Supreme Court declined to hear a marriage case from the Fourth Circuit. I think it was from Maryland. I don't remember exactly what the case was at this moment, but it was from Maryland. So once this, once that the Supreme Court declined it, that meant that the, in the Fourth Circuit, the Fourth Circuit case had ruled that marriage was legal, that you had to let gays and lesbians marry. So that made it, all the states in the Fourth Circuit have legal marriage, whether they liked it or not. So that, on that day that we became legal, the phone rang at around 6 o'clock that night, and the voice said, Lenny, yes, this is Roy Cooper. Attorney General Cooper? Yes. I'm calling to congratulate you and Pearl. Blew my mind away. <laughs> I mean, you know, that he wouldn't have been unhappy about it's one thing, but that he would bother to call and congratulate us really was special to me. And so, yeah, wow, I was right. Mm -hmm. So we were, uh, that was very nice. Uh, that's uh, now. Can I? I want to go back. There's a whole area you, you were asking about, and I let this slip past me. But the uh, cases that you worked no, on, no, the that, ACLU. No, no. Okay. This is about when you were asking about our friends, and oh, okay. I, I, ne I never got to this thing. So you 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 should know about it because Tom Fitzgerald might have mentioned it. But what happened is. Sometime in this whole cycle, from the time we got down here to 71 to the time we're talking about now, which where the people were talking about marriage, well, in between that, there was a long period, decade, you know, a couple of decades of just ordinary life. Well, a few people, Tom Fitzgerald being one of them, started what was called at the time the GAU, the Gay Academic Union. And the Gay Academic Union was for gay academics who were gay and lesbian, but and academics. And we had a group that met uh, in different people's homes, and often in our home, because we had a nice big living room, and that was kind of fun. And, you know, I don't know, there were 20 people maybe in the organization. It eventually died out, but then what got created after that, using many of the same people, was the Triad Business and Professional Guild. And the Triad Business and Professional Guild lasted for more, at least a decade. Uh, we met usually in a hotel, like the Marriott Hotel, and we had a monthly dinner and speech. Um, you know, so at least a dozen meetings a year, and as I say, a speech at every meeting, and different people came and spoke, uh, and sometimes the lawyers. Or I know, I remember one time there were four lawyers in, in the group that sat down for the uh, and gave a speech together. You know, talking about it, but that was a really important addition to the uh, gay and lesbian community in this area. And about how many members did the Triad Business Guild have? It probably had at least 150 members. Um, we would usually get 75, 80 people at a meeting um, at the hotel. And we had the speakers, in, often included, now at one point Roy Cooper spoke, 
Uh, there were other people who ran, who were running for office, who, who locally, who came and made speeches there. Um, it was a group that was, you know, if you wanted to support them, you came, and uh, it and it was a way to meet people. I have a pair of friends, a lesbian couple, and I've been together. I don't know how long, fifteen, eighteen years. Um, that met. I mean, I was sitting at the table, and I one of them came. The, the other one had been there a while. The other, and her, and she had been married and divorced, and but this new woman came to town and sat at the table, and they've been together <laughs> now for all these years. I mean, the guild was a great place to meet people, and to have an enjoyable contact, and. No. Would you say it was influential in promoting the environment in the triad area that we have presently for LGBT communities? I think so. I think it was influential because, um, I mean, people knew about it. Not only gay people, but straight people knew about it. Um, but it it uh, it was important so that, you know, I mean, people came from Winston to come to meetings. and. Uh, it was just a, uh, just a way to have a community that you could interact mm -hmm. with. And again, try business and professional, meaning that they were people who were either uh, business people or professional people in some context. So you know, <laughs> you had everybody: doctors and lawyers and uh, ministers. Uh, it was great. It was a great organization, and when it died out, uh, that was very sad. I had a board. Did you serve on the board? I don't think I did. I don't think I did. Um, I had a good friend who did. I always thought it died out because they, did, they took her off the board because she was the one who got things done. Um, but. But it certainly was a place. New people came to town. You know, I I went to uh, from t you know at UNCG the uh, the kinesiology department had an annual dinner for many years. Mm -hmm. I don't think they still do. At least if they do, I haven't heard about it. But they and they gave out awards to certain alumni and all that. So Pearl and I used to go to the dinner, and we went to the dinner once, and uh, it was about the time. Anyway. Maybe it was, let's see, it was about the 50th anniversary. That would have been about, what is it? About 2007 or two th early 2000s. Anyway, we went to this dinner and we were sitting at, at the table. Somebody was going to get, get this award and, a, and a, somebody brings over a woman to me and she said, I'd like to introduce you to this person. Um, she had just moved back to town. She had been a graduate and she was an alum of that class. Uh, I think it was the class of 57 uh, banquet. Anyway, she was, uh, she was a member of that class, but she's moved back to town and she's having trouble getting in touch with the gay and lesbian community, and so I'm bringing you over to her <laughs> to, to make it to get <laughs> and so, of course, I took care of it, and we've been friends ever since. But uh, that was the kind of thing <laughs> that could happen, and it was it was nice. It was not, and the first thing I did was say to her, "Well, you must come to the guild meetings. The guild, right. you know, you'll meet everybody there." And that that was a great. So I just I didn't want to not mention. Yeah, these I kinds was actually things. that was on my list. Of okay. <laughs> um, so did you? Uh, Go to any of the LGBT oriented clubs in Greensboro? Uh, no. Okay. Just thought I'd ask. <laughs> yeah, we were not, uh, the, 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 they were more for singles. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so, uh, taking you back to the ACLU, can you talk about when you started to work with them and some of the cases you were working on? Uh, let me wait for the sound to go away. Oh uh, yeah, that's fun. We'll just wait for the phone. Maybe your kitty will come in and we can play with her. Because I'm trying to see pictures of the kitty. 
<laughs> You'll need to send me some so I can enjoy that. Yeah, so well, you she, can send me a couple. Yeah. <laughs> you can email them. It takes a, a great deal of um, uh, power not to run over to my, my purse and get my phone out and just start filming the cat. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's a very brave cat coming in here. Yeah, I, I, she was pretty nervous coming in, but I'm glad we meet her approval. Yeah. Yes, yes. Come on, you can sit up here if you want. All yeah. right, okay. I. My service to the ACLU was something that I really enjoyed. I did not um, want to be on their board until after I retired from my full-time work. But um, somebody called me and asked me, you know, to be on it at that point in time, and I said yes. And so I served on the board for uh, two full terms, and I got, I think. Uh, I got as far as being the vice president, but did not uh, want to become the president. I had had enough of that. But um, I liked. It, it's a very important organization, and it takes up so many cases that are significant. Uh, and. You're going to. You want me to talk about the ones I worked on, and I'm sorry to say, I cannot sit here and say, okay, I did this in that case or this. Did you? Um, can you speak about the Pulliam versus Smith case about the child custody battle? Oh, that was a difficult one. Yes. Um, that was a. That was a case where. We did not get it until it had passed the lowest court, so it was on appeal. And that's very difficult then to undo the, um, the trial that was not handled properly. And so in the end, we were not able to prevail. Can you give a brief synopsis of the situation? Oh. Oh. Let me just, can you give me five seconds to go and look? I, sure. I, I have to get myself reconnected okay. to these kinds of things. Okay. It's been a long time. You know, decades goes by and I haven't just going through it.